we want to think a little bit about the Pueblo worldview and the importance of Kachinas in that. I think you're all familiar with the term Kachina and also probably with what they may look like, at least in terms of the Kachina dolls. The Kachina is also that concept, essentially. The, the word Kachina uh, refers to the Kachina doll. Uh, the Kachina Dancer, and also the Kachina Spirit, uh, which I'm going to say more about. Be but before I do, I want you to know there is a move to change the spelling, and along with it, the pronunciation, from Kachinas to Kasinum, uh, which is closer to Native American language and ideas. I'm going to stick with Kachina, however, for right now, because I think that that is more ingrained in popular use and therefore it will be a pronunciation and a spelling that you're more likely to encounter at least in the immediate future. In the context of the Kachinas and especially the dancers uh, and the origin story that supports them I want to talk a little bit more about the sacred spaces of the Pueblos and the very very strong connection that people have to the land. We've already looked at Acoma Pueblo in the context of pottery and Lucy Lewis. I'd like you to take another look at it now in terms of one of the ways in which um, villages are located, situated in relation to the environment. Uh, when folks are trying to create a very defensive position for a village, there's nothing better than a mesa top, and that's going to be true for Acoma Village located about 367 feet up in the air. So the village itself located up here is in a very defensible position. But what I'd also like you to think about is the way in which it is organically conceived and seems to grow out of the mesa itself, as if it's a part of the mesa top. It looks like it belongs there, in other words. There are other types of Pueblo villages that are not on mesa tops. Those are located in valleys, the valley floors below. Let's look at one. Uh, this is Taos, located in New Mexico. And in this instance, you can see that it sits on the valley floor with the mountains behind it. I would also like you to see, and I think the one... The photograph in our textbook is the one in the lower right. I'd like you to see that it does in fact reflect the shapes of the mountains and the irregular levels of the complex itself of the dwellings uh, within the Pueblo uh, project out as the mountain peaks behind them echo the formula that's being by, used by the human beings. So there is an attempt to uh, recreate the shapes of nature and live in harmony with nature. So the Pueblo construction is designed to echo the environment around it, but in addition to that, the sacred spaces that are used by Pueblo dwellers are related very directly to nature and to the landscape. Uh, there are two spaces that I want to talk about. Uh, the first is the Kiva, and the second is the Dance Plaza, which we're looking at more or less right now and we'll return to after we look at the Kiva. Our textbook talks about the Pueblo village as being, quote unquote, the heart of the world. But within that village, there is at least one important Kiva, uh, which, and that's K-I-V-A, which is the center of the village. Uh, it is the focal point of ritual. And in particular, within that Kiva, there is a sacred opening to the underworld which connects our realm to the invisible realm of the spirits. This is called a sapapu. I've got the word located right there. And it is considered to be a portal, a place of emergence, a symbolic reference to the creation story of the Pueblo dwellers, where their ancestors are led out of the underworld, out of the other realm, the spirit realm, into the realm of the living. And they're led out by the spirits, of course. Those spirits are represented in ceremonies today still by the Kachina, uh, who will 
be present as dancers, mass dancers, helping to teach, to reaffirm, and to reenact the origin stories. They will also appear as dolls, as teaching methods, which we'll see uh, very shortly. And then the casina or the kachina themselves are the spirits, the spirits of nature, the spirits associated with the divine, with gods. They also represent the ancestors. The kiva is the most sacred form of religious architecture for the Pueblo dwellers. It allows them to connect uh, to the realm of the spirits. And I would like you to see that it's actually sunken into the earth and to remember that it is from the earth that we come, that we are going to uh, emerge. It would originally have had walls that go all the way up and a roof over it. We would enter through a ladder coming down through a hole. That hole would have been opposite the, located right here, um, the fire pit, which would have been inside. We think the original design of kivas comes out of uh, pit houses because this would have been the form, the early form that people uh, chose for their dwellings. And it would have included a place for a fire and a smoke hole up above it. So we think we're following that. Uh, the pit houses also were circular and they had supports that helped to hold up the roof. And we'll see in a second that we have that here. Okay, what else do we have? We have a circular shape. We have the fire pit. Um, we have um, also behind it uh, what would have acted as a screen to block the air from the ventilation coming into the kiva uh, to protect the fire, to keep the fire from going a little bit crazy as air is hitting it. Uh, we would also have an altar space, and most of all, we would have the sapapu. Uh, and again, that's located right here. And that's just a symbolic hole that represents the origin story, the emergence of the Pueblo dwellers from the earth led out by the Kachina or Casina. If we go over to the diagram, we can see that there are stone benches uh, located right here in between the supports. These are the supports. Our textbook, I think, calls them pilasters uh, that go up to uh, help to support the roof. But there's bench space for people to sit to engage in rituals inside the uh, kivas themselves. These are subterranean regions, and they're pretty big sometimes, ranging in diameter from 20 to 60 feet. Uh, the smaller ones belong to uh, kinship groups, uh, perhaps clans. The bigger ones would have been for large-scale group meetings, religious meetings, uh, within the community itself. Uh, perhaps some of them also uh, serving the purpose of pilgrims coming to visit the site. The walls of the kivas might, not always, but might also have been painted with relig religious images that would have basically told the origin story and the other uh, belief stories of the uh, Pueblo dwellers. Uh, before leaving this, I want to stress the fact, and you have to imagine that it is covered, uh, that this is an example of incredibly successful religious architecture. What makes uh, architecture uh, successful in terms of serving the needs of religion, or what makes successful religious architecture? Well, one, it has to reveal the beliefs of the people. And in this, with the Sapapu, we have a visible reminder of our origins and our connections to the earth and a reminder of the tiered universe itself. Okay. We also have to uh, have a space that allows us to feel connected to the divine or to the realm of the spirits. And I would argue in this darkened interior, and remember we have to climb down a ladder from the hole in the roof to get inside. It would be darkened. We would have a fire that would help to illuminate the interior, but it would be absolutely perfect for a space in which we could enact rituals, allowing us to feel very connected to the world of the spirit. A successful religious architecture also reinforces the sense of community and shared beliefs within the community. And the kiva would certainly do that. 
there is a second uh, sacred space, but this sacred space is public, and the nature of the space is a little bit different. It is a space that we can use for purposes of, uh, I'm going to say, greater festivities, a little bit more of entertainment, and a little bit more joyous performance. You can now see the reason, one reason, that the choice for designing Pueblo construction, like a Taos Pueblo up in the top left, which is tiered basically, we have different setbacks in the design of the building. What that does is create terracing spaces so that people from the Pueblo can gather and they can watch ritual presentations that take place in the dance plaza, essentially in the center of the uh, buildings at Taos Pueblo. Pueblo. There are two blocks, uh, a northern block and a southern block of houses, and the dance plaza is in between them, uh, allowing uh, the people of the Pueblo to gather for festivals, particularly associated with the return of the Kachinas. And that's what we're looking at here in figure 214. This is a painting that depicts the way in which the people would gather on uh, the lower level on benches and chairs and then on the terraces of the Pueblo, the setbacks of the Pueblo construction up above so that they would be able to observe the festival that's taking place below. This is a painting uh, that is a uh, an image done in the early half of the first quarter of the 20th century by uh, a native artist whose name is Fred Cabote. Uh, at the time that he was creating these images, it was not always acceptable uh, to share this kind of information with uh, non-native peoples. So he took a little flack for that, but he felt that it was important to, uh, to share uh, the, the festivals, the designs, the religious ceremonies, at least to some extent, uh, so that outsiders could come to understand and appreciate uh, the beliefs and ideas and traditions of the Pueblos. The ritual performances take place in what we could call a dance plaza, and our textbook author talks about a place where you can display reciprocity. Okay, what she's talking about, or what our authors are talking about, is that this is a kind of zone where two worlds meet. The world of the living and acting rituals that reflect the world of the divine. And these performances, and they are performances, this is somewhat theater, religious theater as well, uh, incorporate um, dancing that is uh, enacted by men who wear masks. And I'm going to use the word, this is Western idea, uh, impersonating the kachina. So first, let me reiterate what the kachina are, or the kachinam uh, are. Uh, they are supernaturals. They're spirit forces. They might uh, embody the powers in nature, the forces of nature. They might be uh, outright divine beings themselves. They also certainly are the ancestors. So when we die, we can also become a kachina. Um, these very, very important beings come to visit the Pueblos uh, during, basically during the growing season. The ritual calendar of the uh, many of the Pueblo dwellers is, I'm going to say, roughly parallel to the solstices and the growing cycle. Uh, beginning in uh, February, you would uh, start to make preparation for the arrival of the Kachina, who would come to your village and would bring with them uh, gifts and music and joy and also uh, the springtime and the rains. So these are important figures. They're also joyful figures, uh, essentially bringing you presents and gifts. Along with us, we'll see music. There are hundreds of Kachinas or Kachinam. Some of them arriving will be, um, I'm going to say, presented in a very public way uh, by the males of the community who are going to wear masks. And uh, we in the West are going to have the tendency uh, to describe this as an impersonation of the Kachina. Uh, what a Pueblo dweller would say instead is that uh, the human being is allowing uh, the Kachina, the spirit, essentially to manifest itself through the body of the human being. 
the masks that are worn in these rituals are considered so sacred that after the ceremonies are over, the masks are actually taken apart. Uh, all of the decoration is removed from them, and essentially they are decommissioned as a ritual object. Uh, the Pueblo dwellers uh, consider it a profanity to actually put these into museums and to display them or for collectors to have them.